You are a chosen people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Welcome to Belmont Exeter. I'm Clive Hughes, one of the leadership team here. It's great to have you join us, however you're watching on our live YouTube premiere or on DVD. And if you're new to Belmont, then you're especially welcome. We'd love to get to know you. Please say hi in the chat or get in touch through the Connect page on our website. And we'll go back to you really shortly on email or a phone call. As this live premiere goes out, people are also gathered at Belmont Chapel in Exeter to worship the Lord Jesus. The youth and children's groups are also meeting at the very same time. We're so grateful for everyone who's helping to reopen activities so we can worship the Lord and follow him together. If you'd like to join us in person, you are really welcome. We ask that you book a seat via the website or the My Church Suite app. There's no need to wait for a turn, whether you're just looking into Christianity or whether you've been following Jesus for a long time. Please do come and join us. If you can get a seat, it is booking up quickly. Today, we're looking at a part of the Bible where a people are regrouping after a period of exile. Sound familiar? Nick will be leading us to think about how God's work through Ezra can teach us something for our lives today. Wherever you are and whatever you're doing in the week, whatever the week has brought to you this morning, we come to praise the Lord through what he's been doing in us and through us, working in our weeks in all our activities. Whether we've been caring for family, writing computer code, delivering products, teaching others, caring for patients, constructing homes. The Lord has been at work in his world through you, showing others the kingdom of God. In Psalm 89, the writer comes with praise to the Lord for who the Lord is. He says this, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through the all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? As we come to sing praise the Lord, let's pray first. Dear Father, Lord God, we praise and worship you you are faithful. You are at work in your world. Father, we come to you with thanks for all you have done in Jesus, bringing all things together in him, reconciling us to yourself by Christ's death and resurrection. Speak to us now and meet with us as we gather. In your name and for the praise of your glory. Amen. Through 
take every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take. Every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Each week we are hearing from people who are serving Jesus on their front lines to encourage us with positive stories of what is happening in our community and give us ideas of how we can spread some light too. Students are a significant part of Exeter City and we love to welcome them into the Belmont Church family while they're here. But with many freshers arriving in September last year to a virtual lockdown, how would they ever get to make real friends or find a spiritual home in Exeter? Many students we get to know are passionate about reaching out with the gospel and working for God's justice in the world. But with so many restrictions, how would they ever be able to run the events and create the connections with others that they usually do? Well, we've prayed a lot for students this year, and we're gonna hear from some members of two student societies, Just Love and the ECU, about how God has been at work. Hi, I'm Hannah. I'm the current co-president at Just Love Exeter. And I'm Olivia, and I was on committee last year. So Just Love is a national organisation with groups at many unis across the UK. We focus on equipping students to pursue social justice issues by learning more about them um, and acting out against them through things like volunteering. Uh, we believe that justice is a really important part of the Christian faith and that God calls his people to help the poor and vulnerable in society. And we just think that uni is a great time to reach people and equip them to do this. So this term, we've really seen God work through um, helping us as a new committee to get to know each other and work well as a team. We've also seen him through conversations that we've had at our Just Love Breakfast, um, which we run every Saturday um, for the homeless people in Exeter. And we've also seen God work through conversations we've had at our Wednesday lunchtime events um, with people within the Just Love community. Another way that we've seen God working is in our Stand for Freedom at the end of March. So this was a 24 hour virtual event to raise awareness for modern day slavery. And we set a target of raising £5,000, which would fund a whole rescue mission for IJM, which is the International Justice Mission. Um, God really worked in that amazingly. We overtook that target. Um, so we really thank everybody at Belmont for your prayers for that event. We, yeah, we really appreciate it. It was a great event. Yeah, and we've got three events coming up in the next couple of weeks. So on the 6th of June, we're doing a fundraiser event for Tier Fund's COVID vaccine programme. Um, we will collectively be climbing the height of Kilimanjaro down at Pupe Lane um, near St David's. Um, and then we have a social event, which will be a prayer and worship just to come together as a community um, after, after such a year. Um, and then on the 11th of June, we will have a speaker come and talk to us about global health and justices, um, which we're hoping will be really interesting. Hi, I'm Harry. And over the last year, I've been on the committee for the university's Evangelical Christian Union. The committee started in March 2020, and we were expecting to be able to continue doing events to share the gospel on campus. But as you know, it's been quite an unexpected year, and we've had to adapt and uh, change our plans. Uh, one challenge has been creating and publicising online events that really engage people um, and share the gospel through that. As well as this, it's been hard to maintain a sense of community and to get to know new first years arriving in September. But God has been good and has been faithful to us. CU members have continued to be encouraged uh, to share the gospel, whether that's through online events or through personal conversations. The carol service, for instance, uh, received nearly 1,600 views uh, on the night of the event and the following day, which is completely amazing. Um, and all glory goes to God for that. Um, as well as this, I've really been encouraged by getting to know some first years, um, whether that was on Zoom in September or more recently as restrictions have eased. And God has been so good at providing uh, these people to continue his mission on campus, continue to love people like Jesus and tell people 
about him. So I'm really excited for the next year and it would be amazing if you could be praying for the new committee, giving them wisdom um, as restrictions ease and also praying for the CU community in general, that God would provide new opportunities for them to be sharing the gospel um, and ultimately, please be praying that students at the university come to know Jesus as their saviour. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alfie. I'm a first year at the university studying maths and I'm part of the student group here at Belmont. When I first came to university back in September, I was quite anxious about coming, about meeting people and making new friends. And I was also nervous about finding a church uh, family to call home, especially because I'd spent my whole life up to this point in the same church um but god has been so kind and i'm so thankful for how he's blessed me in this um with my flatmates two of them are christians and that's been a real blessing because it means i've got people nearby who i can go to if i feel down or if i need prayer for anything um and through the christian union i've been able to meet up with other christians um, both within Belmont and in the other churches in the city and really feel like part of God's family at the university. Um, as for church, Belmont has welcomed me so, so much. Um, I knew kind of when I came here on my first Sunday that this is where I wanted to come. And I did try a few other churches, but nowhere else did I feel so much like part of the family so quickly um, and the student group has just continued that it's brilliant the bible teaching here I get so much from and God speaks to me really through it um, and I'm looking forward to ways that I can start serving in the church. I'm Bethany and I'm a first year studying English. During my first term in Exeter, I found my main struggle was connecting with others. I didn't find many friendships through my accommodation or course, and so once Freshers' Week ended and everybody started settling into friendships, I found myself quite lonely. Something I was really thankful for was the Christian Union, as it wasn't, in, wasn't until a friend linked me with the CU that I really started to connect with other students. All of a sudden, I was joining an online weekend away, meeting people through various Bible studies and calls, going kayaking and embarking on prayer walks. Connecting with the Christian Union really changed my university experience. I'm really thankful for the ways God used the CU to help me form friendships and connections with other Christian students. A significant way I've seen God at work this year has been in the cultivation of friendships. Even though meeting people was made more difficult by COVID, the pandemic provided the opportunity for one-on-one -on -one meetups and some really significant building of friendships. It's meant that when I have met people, I've been able to focus on really getting to know them and making the most of the time we have to spend together. Hello, uh, my name's Josiah. I'm a fresher at the University of Exeter, my first year, just finishing up, and I'm studying geography. Okay, so what's been one of the challenges for me? Um, I think being indoors a lot. Um, the course has been very much online, uh, lots of videos and Zoom calls, um, which can get quite tedious um, after a long day of work. Um, and yeah, things like societies as well being online has been kind of difficult because um, I really value person-to-person -person interaction. So it's kind of led to some things of isolation stuff, which has been kind of hard um, quite often. Um, one of the highlights for me has been getting involved with Christian Union, doing CU stuff. It's been really, really fun. Um, and that's also provided some incredible opportunities um, and showed me where, where God's been helping me and sustaining my faith. Um, he's been showing me how I can trust him and continue to trust him even when things seem really, really bleak and difficult, particularly in second term when I was living at home the entire time. Um, yeah, I've just learned how much I can trust him, I think, how much God is such yeah such a light for me um particularly in difficult times and how i need to trust him because that is how i can find purpose and yeah there's been so many good ways to witness i think which has been a really real blessing which has been yeah for me a clear sign that god's at work that his word is still getting around campus despite what's been going on with uh, covid one of the biggest ways that i've seen god work this year has been in the number of conversations that i've had with other people about what Christians believe and about what my story of faith is in particular. Um, quite regularly, late at night, um, and often just one-on-one, -on -one, someone might ask me, uh, what is your story? Like, why do you act like this? Why do you believe it? 
Um, and in that moment, I've just got to remember to trust God that he will give me the words to say and remember that it's him that will change their heart and reveal himself to them, not just my words. Um, and on that note, I'd quite like to ask for prayer for all of our students here at Belmont, that we would be a blessing to our flatmates and housemates and course mates, um, and that we, he would give us opportunities to share him with them. Our loving Lord, we are so thankful for many answered prayers this year. Thank you for the way you've helped freshers settle into good relationships and find a place in the ECU and in church families. And thank you for the joy of getting to know first years at Belmont. And we pray for ongoing, deepening relationships with them. We thank you for just love and for their passion to live distinctively and to work for your justice in Exeter and beyond. We give thanks for the lives that will be changed by their practical fundraising and campaigning activities. And we pray for your ongoing blessing and guidance for the new committee as they plan for next term. And we pray that you'll inspire and empower them to bring about lasting change for good on a local and global scale. We thank you for the ECU and their desire to see all students on campus have a chance to know your life-changing love. Thank you for the ways they've been able to share the gospel through online events and also for rich relationships they've been able to form this year. We pray that you would keep them faithful in their prayer and witness to friends that you would strengthen and inspire the new committee and hall group leaders as they plan for next year, and that more and more students would have a chance to meet Jesus through them. Lord, we give thanks for the many ways we've been able to see you at work through the lives of students and through the wider church this year, despite so many restrictions. Like our student friends, we long to see the good news of your kingdom spread here in Exeter and in the wider world through our words, prayers and actions. We pray that where we hit frustrations and obstacles in the coming days, we might keep looking to you with thankfulness and trust, knowing that you are at work in and through us. And we pray this for your glory, Lord. Amen. God works through us in different ways. Sometimes it's through the things that we do. Sometimes it's through things he teaches us that we can then share with others. And sometimes it's through his character being built in us that has an impact on others. But we may not always see this happening. So this week, if you see God at work in someone else, why not tell them and give thanks to God? We are going to read together from the book of Ezra. So if you would like to turn that up in your Bible or on your device. If you're having trouble finding it, it's in between two chronicles and the book of Nehemiah. I'm going to read uh, Ezra chapter one um, from verse one. But before we do that, let's pray together for ourselves and for Nick. Lord God, we want to thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, that it has come to us uh, through history and that we can read about it now. We pray, Lord, that you might speak to us this very morning, please. May we see wondrous things in your law and we pray, uh, Lord, that you might move our hearts this morning, that we might uh, love you with our, with our mind, our soul and our strength. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, King of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, King of Persia says. The Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he's appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judea 
and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to be provided to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. All their neighbours assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock and with valuable gifts, in addition to all the free will offerings. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought to Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Shesh Bazar, the prince of Judah. This was the inventory, gold dishes, 30, silver dishes, 1,000, silver pans, 29, gold bowls, 30, matching silver bowls, 410, other articles, 1,000. In all, there were 5,400 articles of gold and of silver. Shesh Bazar brought all these along with the exiles when they came up from Babylon to Jerusalem. This morning, we're starting a new teaching series based in what I think is an oft neglected part of the Old Testament in the book of Ezra. Over the next eight weeks, we're going to explore something of the story of the return from exile of God's people. You can find more details about this series in our new term card, which is available on the Belmont website. But before we look at the passage, I think it might be helpful to consider something of the history and the context of the story that we're going to be following closely over the next couple of months. In a display case within the Middle Eastern collection housed at the British Museum, there is a most unusual artifact, which to the casual gallery visitor may appear rather insignificant. It's an ancient clay cylinder from the 6th century BC, on which is inscribed a royal decree in cuneiform writing. It's relatively small, only about nine inches long, and at its largest point, only four inches in diameter. And it would be quite easy to walk past it without giving it more than a cursory glance. But the significance of this particular artefact is remarkably rich. Part of the writing on the cylinder describes the capture of Babylon in 539 BC by the armies of Persia. The story that we find mentioned briefly in scripture at the end of Daniel chapter five as having taken place on the night of Belshazzar's feast. It also tells of how the Persian king Cyrus was instrumental in rebuilding several temples of worship dedicated to various gods, as well as describing his proclamation announcing the return of captured people groups to their various homelands. Now, such a policy was revolutionary and the importance of the Cyrus Cylinder, as this artefact has become known, has led to historians describing it as one of the earliest charters of human rights, since it shows a respect for differing cultures and racial groups that was unheard of at the time. Earlier in the history of God's people, of course, both the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah had fallen victim to a very different racial cleansing policy enacted by the then Babylonian ruler Nebuchadnezzar. He exiled captured people to foreign lands in an attempt to destroy allegiances to culture and place. He sought to break the will of God's people, for instance, by deporting them forcibly to Babylon. His policy was one of exile, of oppression, and forced assimilation. And whilst uh, the wording on the cylinder reveals, uh, Cyrus believed that he had been chosen by the Babylonian god Marduk to restore peace and order, the writer of the book of Ezra sees the god Yahweh, the Lord God of the Bible, as being the true means through which the people of Judah were now being offered the chance to return and rebuild. And the story of Ezra chapter one is a remarkable one. It describes an amazing opportunity, a chance to rebuild a damaged national identity, an opportunity to return to a place of known blessing and to reconnect with a God whose faithfulness had proved to be constant despite the people's faltering allegiance. So over the next eight weeks, as we look at the book of Ezra together, we will get to see that it's in fact a book of two parts each part telling the story of the return of successive groups of God's people to the land of promise. 
The first part of the book, the section to the end of chapter six, tells of the first of three waves of exiles who respond to King Cyrus's decree. This is by far and away the largest group of returnees as we're about to discover next week when we look at chapter two. And after that, there's a gap of almost 60 years before the story resumes at the start of chapter seven, which is when we get to read about Ezra himself and the second wave of returning exiles. But if we want to read about the third wave, then we need to read on into the book of Nehemiah where the story continues. Now, whether or not Ezra wrote the entire book that bears his name and whether or not the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one single volume remains open to some scholarly speculation. Personally, I, I don't think we need to get sidetracked in trying to resolve those questions, since in truth, the answers are not overly important. Instead, it's the message of the book that needs to be front and centre for us. Now, the book of Ezra is concerned primarily with one big theme, the rebuilding of the house of God. An emphasis echoed in other places, of course, such as in the prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah that we studied at the beginning of last year. But we mustn't be misled into thinking that this is simply a rebuilding project in purely bricks and mortar terms. Whilst it's true that the physical temple needed to be rebuilt, that forms only one part of a greater and more far-reaching building project. Ezra's concern is primarily about the restoration of a worshipping community. It's about rebuilding a spiritual temple, God's people in God's place, reflecting God's truth and living out God's kingdom values. It's about the importance of being a gathered community. It's about visibility. It's about the need to be the city on a hill that Jesus speaks about in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. And as we've recently been reminded of from Peter's first letter, this spiritual temple, the church, is made up of individual lives joined together with Christ as the cornerstone. Peter writes this, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. That's 1 Peter 2 and verse 5. And in a similar way, Paul reminds his readers in Ephesus that in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple to the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. That's Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 21. And my hope for all of us as we study this book is that we will see the necessity of being active participants in that continuous present tense work of being built into a spiritual house, a worshipping, gathered community that increasingly reflects the values of God's kingdom. So this morning, very briefly, we're going to consider these 11 verses that Simon has read for us under two one-word headings, release and return. Firstly then, let's think about that first word, shall we? Release. You know, over the past few days here in the UK, we have experienced something of a relief ourselves as the easing of some of the restrictions that have been in place for several months to limit the spread of COVID-19 infection have been eased. As a result of that relaxation, families and friends have been able to reconnect. Those previously scattered are now able to gather. And while some restrictions remain in place, there has been, I'm sure, for many people, a real sense of release and joy at being able to reconnect with loved ones again. Something that we've experienced too, of course, within the Belmont family as we've been able to open up the church for in-person gathered worship once again. And for the people of God in Ezra chapter one, release had been a long time coming. Almost 70 years had passed since the city of Jerusalem had been razed to the ground by the army of the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar when large sections of the population had been forcibly exiled to a foreign land and many had been killed with communities and family groups torn apart. But sadly, that event could have been avoided. Prophets such as Jeremiah had warned God's people that disaster was heading their way if they refused to listen to God's appeal to turn back to him. God's words through Jeremiah in chapter 21 are both clear and remarkably specific. This is what we read. 
I will give all Judah into the hands of the king of Babylon, who will carry them away to Babylon or put them to the sword. I will deliver all the wealth of this city into the hands of their enemies, all its products, all its valuables and all the treasures of the kings of Judah. They will take it away as plunder and carry it to the land of Babylon. And yet God also speaks of hope. Should the people continue to ignore God and rush headlong into disaster, then, says God through Jeremiah, release from oppression would eventually come. In chapter 25 of the same prophecy, Jeremiah speaks God's words again. Because you have not listened to my words, this whole country will become a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon. Now, these are the verses that the writer of Ezra references right at the start of chapter one. This is what we read. In order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm. And the words that follow become the release papers, if you like, for the captive people of God. Whilst the people had been unfaithful in keeping their side of the promise bargain, God remained faithful to both his covenant and his word. God's call upon this specific people group was that they should become a light to the nations. It was through them that the knowledge of God would be revealed, a plan that would find its ultimate fulfillment in Christ. And amazingly, in us as well, if we know and trust him as saviour. Since we are, as Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. And it's God's ultimate sovereignty that we find revealed in this story, isn't it? It's the God who moves or stirs up the heart of King Cyrus. It's clear from the words on the Cyrus cylinder that it wasn't only the Jews who benefited from Cyrus's proclamation. He appears to have decided that it was politically expedient for him to repatriate all the people groups that the Babylonian Empire had captured and scattered. So both politics and prophecy become part of the total picture. What politicians may devise for their own purposes can be taken and used by God as he continues to work out his plan. A fact that reminds us, of course, of the importance of praying for those in authority over us. A lesson again that we learned, didn't we, from 1 Peter. And notice too that Cyrus doesn't send the people back empty handed. He ensures that the success of his political policy will adequately happen by funding it well. Firstly, it appears through taxation and then through charitable giving. Look again at verse four. And in all and in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. But notice too that it wasn't only the heart of Cyrus that had been stirred up by the Lord God. It was also everyone whose heart of God had moved. Which leads us to our second point, return. Now, just this past week, Paula and I were able to travel to London to spend some time with our son Jack and his partner Nat. It was good to be able to do that, to take full advantage of the relaxation of restrictions so that we could be reunited with family that we hadn't been able to spend time with for several months. During the week, we travelled into central London. And whilst the tube trains were less busy than they would have been pre-COVID, I certainly felt a sense of slight apprehension in making that decision to travel. Cyrus's degree in the early part of the chapter was graciously made available for anyone to accept. There was no direct caveat or disbarring. Any or all of God's people could travel to Jerusalem. Yet not all went. Now, I think we need to be careful with the way that we read the phrase that I've just quoted from, from verse five. Since I don't think that it means that God only moved the hearts of certain individuals, I'm sure that's not what's being conveyed here. Instead, it's the response of the individual to God's prompting that's in view. A few thousand people, as we'll discover next week, grasped the opportunity with both hands. They took a big step of faith. They prepared themselves for an arduous thousand mile trip that we know from Ezra's experience in chapter seven took four months. Very few 
If any of those who travelled would have remembered the home country, no one knew what to expect or what they would find when they arrived at Jerusalem. And yet they went. They recognised God's call upon their lives to be a distinctive people, and they journeyed together, collectively prepared to bear the cost. Now, there are others who decided to stay, undoubtedly many more, who had settled quite comfortably in Babylon. They had assimilated into the culture that surrounded them. They were quite content to remain. Maybe they held God at arm's length, and the stories that were passed down to them, they viewed merely as myths with no perceivable relevance to their everyday lives. So why on earth would they uproot themselves and travel? I think it would be very easy to slip into such a habit of disengagement. But the practice of faith involves risk-taking. Yet we've become naturally fearful of that physically. But I hope and pray it won't become our default position spiritually. The final few verses of our passage this morning is, I think, a wonderful confirmation to those who are about to set out towards Jerusalem to build God's house confirmation that they had made the right choice. Who could have guessed that the items set apart for worship in the temple in Jerusalem, those items that had been plundered by Nebuchadnezzar's army, were still being held safely in the temple of a pagan god? Who could have guessed that Cyrus would be prepared to part with such treasure? And once more, what do we see? Well, we see the God's hand at work as he encourages and inspires his people by giving them tangible reminders of what being a worshipping community looked and felt like. The work of rebuilding was underway. God was at work and his people were once again prepared to follow him. And I like to think that there was a real sense of anticipation amongst those returning exiles. As we will discover over the next few weeks, though, the work of rebuilding was going to be hard. The people of God would need to pull together. They would need to submit one to another in order to make progress. And whilst they would certainly share times of great joy, they would also struggle in times of disappointment and dismay. And what was true then, I think, remains true now. I think we as a community have some rebuilding work to do as we once again commit ourselves to continue to grow together into the kind of people God wants us to be. In the story of the returning exiles, we discover that it wasn't simply rebuilding work that was needed. There was also repurposing and restorative work that needed to be done. But it was something they did together as stones being built into a spiritual house. Let's finish, shall we, with that very familiar verse from 1 Peter 2.9. A verse that I think would have been a wonderful encouragement to the rebuilders of Ezra's day. And it's a verse that is vital for 21st century spiritual builders too. Here are those well familiar words, verses, words that we have come to love. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. May God bless us as we too return, as we too rebuild. May God bless us as we spend time together in community, as we just become the kind of people increasingly that God wishes us to be. Amen. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us we pray, and may your eye remain. Come set our hearts a place to go, like wine found in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come in us now.
Thank you for being with us today. And thank you to all those who've helped in our worship, both on camera and behind camera. Following on from the live premiere, there is a chance to pray with others and to respond to God with what we've heard today. The details of the Zoom prayer time are in the chat. During the week, we're meeting in small groups where we discuss the Bible and pray with each other as we share the story and live the life of Jesus through ordinary lives. If you'd like to join a midweek group, then get in touch again on email or on the Connect form and we'll get right back to you. Our evening service is on Zoom with people coming together at 6.30 to chat in breakout rooms and then the service starting proper at seven o'clock. Details again in the chat or on your focus email. We look forward to seeing you in person at Belmont soon. Just a reminder, book on the website or on your My Church Suite app. Bookings usually open Monday lunchtime. It'll be great to see you. Thank you for worshipping with us today. Let's pray together as we go. Lord, we pray that this week we'll be recognisable as your people living for your glory in each and every action. Give us love, power, grace and courage as we serve you, whether it's when we're gathered together or in individual activities. We pray this in the name of Jesus, for his praise and for his glory. Amen. God bless you and have a great week. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, Hero of Heaven. You conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things, we have seen your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted I, oh God. You have done great things, oh God, you have done great things. Shake a bow, hallelujah, you have done great things, 
You've done great things Oh, oh hero of heaven, of heaven You conquered the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God You have done great things again Oh hero of heaven You conquered the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God You have done great things Oh God You have done great things